Hello and welcome to another video in the series Archaeology and Islam. My name is Dan Gibson and in this video we're going to investigate pre-Islamic gods and how they impacted the rise of Islam in Arabia. In our previous video we looked at a number of pre-Islamic gods that were worshipped in Petra and uh, also mentioned, uh, these are mentioned in the early Islamic sources. You see, Islam rose out of paganism and polytheism, and so I believe that once we understand how the pagans viewed their gods, it will help us understand Islam in a new light. Now, before we get started on this, I would like to put things in context. When I was a young 17-year-old in college, I took a class on the ancient Greek language. That teacher became one of my favorite teachers, and he also taught a class in theology, which I also took. That theology class was pivotal in shaping my understanding about how God could be understood. In that class, they talked about the characteristics of God, or the attributes of God. I learned a lot in that class, especially about how we think and view things. Ever since then, I have been aware that people everywhere understand God differently. They do this because they assign different attributes to God. A few years later, I was living in the Middle East with my new bride, and we were adopted into a Muslim family. It was then that I decided I wanted to understand Islam through the eyes of a normal Muslim family. Not the textbook stuff, but the everyday stuff that Muslims believe and practice. It was then that I discovered that they saw God through different eyes. I understood Christianity through the attributes that I had studied, but they understood God through a different set of attributes. But it wasn't until I began to study the gods of pre-Islamic Arabia that I began to put things together. And I began to understand that uh, these attributes, where did they come from? And I began to look at uh, how did they influence Islam? So let's back up and try to understand a typical Nabataean and his view of the gods and the gods that he worshipped through the eyes of the attributes of these gods that he worshipped. First of all, like pagans uh, everywhere, um, they understood that the universe was full of unseen forces at work in the universe around them. They attributed these forces to various gods. However, the Nabataeans were typical merchants who moved their goods around Arabia. Um, in their minds, different gods were found in different regions. There was gods, uh, some gods in Basra. They overlapped their area, but there were gods in uh, Gia, near Petra, and so forth. So these, these gods were around. For instance, Alat, the moon god, people call her, uh, draws our attention to celestial things, things in the stars. Dushera, on the other hand, was the god of the mountains, drawing our attention to the solid rock. If this god was angry, the earth would shake. If Alat was angry, the cosmos, something in the stars or in the sky or in the weather, would affect them in some way. Some of these gods had multiple names or attributes that were actually uh, attached to them. Dushera could be called Hubail in one place and Baal Shaman in another. At the very same time, people could refer to him as Rahman, the merciful. He was also known as Hanun, the compassionate. People also use the title, Blessed Be His Name Forever. Another god was Alusa the Mighty. This god was associated with fertility. This included the springtime, the birth of animals, and human sexuality. Manat, another god, was the god of fate. Fate was in control of everything around us. al Kutbi was the god of writing, sacred to merchants. al Kaum was the god of protection and the god of war sacred also to caravan merchants who trusted this god for the protection of their caravans. These gods were not just sacred, they were precious. So when the prophet Muhammad started preaching, the polytheists were very upset. They felt attached to their gods. Their gods had helped them in the past and they were not about to give them up. These were not only their gods, but uh, they gave meaning to life and structure to their everyday life. 
Now, let's do an interesting project. Let's compare the attributes of Allah as understood in Islam with the attributes of the pre-Islamic gods. I think this will help explain why there is such a huge difference between Islam and Christianity and also Judaism. You see, Christianity and Judaism understand the attributes of God taken from the writings of the prophets. If you sit down Jewish rabbis and Christian theologians in the same room and have them discuss the attributes of God, you will find that uh, there are some similarities, but they'll start drawing things from the Old Testament and they will agree on these because the Jewish and the Christian roots go back to those prophets and that, those writings. But when Muslims and Christians sit down, the attributes of God often become a problem. Some years ago, it was popular to have interfaith discussions. I remember taking a group of students uh, to a mosque and we were doing uh, this, uh, these dialogues and discussing how we saw things. And there was some attempt uh, to demonstrate uh, how close Christianity and Islam really were. This was mostly driven by the Muslim side of the room. But when we came to the attributes of God, that's where we disagreed. There was a huge disagreement. And now, years later, as I study the Islamic gods, things start to come to play, into place. First of all, Dushera, or Hubal, or Baal Shaman, as described as the Lord of the worlds. He is the creator of mankind. He is called Rahman, the merciful, Hanun, the compassionate, generous uh, and rewarding. All of these concepts and these names have come from polytheism, from pre-Islamic Arabia into Islam. When Muhammad described God, Allah, to the polytheists, he used terms that were familiar to them. He was doing cross-cultural communication, and so he used their terms, and he described God using some of the traits of Hubal. Now, he, I'm not saying, and he didn't say they're the same thing. That's not what we're saying here, but he's using terms to help them understand who Allah is. So, what about Alat? Alat was a military god and a moon god, and these concepts found their way into Islam. Muhammad... Um, used and accepted the crescent moon symbol. He also encouraged the followers of Allah to fight for their faith. Military action was seen as part of worship of God. That's true in Islam, true uh, back then in uh, Alat. What about Elisa, the mighty? Well, she was not only a military goddess, she was also a fertility goddess. The Romans recognized her as one of their gods, Aphrodite, and others recognized her as the goddess Asherah, who was worshipped in the Asherah groves, um, where, which were trees around her. There would be a tree, and they would uh, most like, uh, likely a, a low tree, and they would decorate it, and they would have the fertility goddess who was there, and you find that in Hittite writing and Ugarit writing and so forth. In Islam, a low tree, or Sidrat al-Muntah is in Arabic, is marks the end of the seventh uh, heaven and the boundary between where man can be and where God is. Nobody can go beyond. You see, Muhammad used symbolism that the worshippers of al uzza could understand. A lot tree used in the worship of al uzza marks a separation in Islam in paradise between where God is and where mankind dwells. No one can pass it. Imagine the smiles on the faces of those who venerated Alusa when the prophet mentions a lot tree in paradise. It speaks to them. Do you see how different characteristics of different gods were incorporated into Islamic thought? What about the goddess al Manat, the goddess of fate? This is one of the things that I found most frustrating when I was in the Muslim world. This concept of fate. Things are they're written down, they're fixed. I saw two men carrying a large glass window to be installed. The guy at the back wasn't paying a lot of attention, and he dropped the window, and it smashed. The only excuse given was, it is written, and they went back for another window. Something inside of me said, no, you are responsible for not being careful. But everyone there accepted that God had willed the breaking of the window. It was fate. Friends, 
I can see the influence of Manat. Additionally, the followers of Manat used to go on pilgrimage to the Kaaba. We're told that. And we're told that there in front of the idol of Manat, which was beside Hubel, that's where they would shave their heads at the end of the pilgrimage. What do we find today? Pilgrims on the Hajj all shave their heads. So the idea of fate and the practice of shaving heads in the Hajj all began way back in the Elyhanite desert with Al-Manat. And it made its way into Islam. Well, next we come to al Qutbi, the god of writing. This attribute often puzzles Christians. What is so special about writing? But in Islam, writing is very important. They believe that God not only sent prophets, but that he sent books. Each prophet brought a book, or multitude books. God communicates in writing to the world. Those who follow the god Qutbi would have been very pleased with this attribute of God. Allah is especially interested in books. Next, al Kalm, or the God of War, or protection. Again, this enforces the idea of fighting for your religion. It enforces the idea of protecting your family and the honor of your family and the honor of the prophets. These are concepts that Christians struggle to understand, but they're found in Islam, and they make their way there through al -Kaum. Additionally, al -Kaum refused to drink wine, and the followers of al -Kaum did not drink alcohol, and this also passed into Islam. Now, what am I saying? As a Christian who has studied Islam in great detail, and who has also gone back and studied the history of Arabia before Islam, I recognize that the attributes of God are seen differently. Christians see God differently than Muslims. This is one of the greatest differences between the two religions. The gap is so wide and so different that many Christians believe that God and Allah are two different things. Now, I do not believe that there are two gods. I'm adamant there's only one God. And both religions are monotheists, so they are not trying to say that uh, they worship different gods. What I am saying is that Islam and Christians see God very differently. Very differently. I do not know all of the answers. But when I view the gods of pre-Islamic Arabia, I seem to see that many things from the pagans were adopted into Islam. That's what it looks like to me. When I study Christian history, I see many things from the lives of the previous prophets who are adopted into Christianity. Christians spend a great deal of time studying the writings of the prophets. If you want to study this out, I urge you to find a copy of the Bible. It's available in different languages, online and in bookstores, and read the Old Testament. As you read it, try to discern, are the characteristics and attributes of God in the Bible the same as the attributes and the characteristics of God in the Quran? Read the New Testament. Ask yourself this question. Are the characteristics and attributes of God in the Bible the same as the characteristics and the attributes of God in the Quran? This is an area I think we can all learn more from. Write me. Uh, if you find something interesting, write me. I'd be glad to hear from you. I'm learning about this as I go along. So I'm Ben Gibson, and this has been another video in the series, Archaeology and Islam.